Let me hide myself in you. Let the water in the blood from my riven side, which both be of sin and a double cure. Save me from its guilt and power. Nothing in my hands I bring, simply to the cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress, helpless look to thee for grace. Foul I to the fountain fly, wash me, Savior, I die. When my eyes shall close in death, when I soar to worlds unknown, see thee on my judgment throne, rock of ages cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. Welcome to Empty Cross Ministries Bible Study. I'm Brother David. The name of the program is KJ The Exposed. That's King James Version Exposed. Uh, tonight we're going to be looking at uh, Eve, the mother of all mothers, the mother of us all. We're going to be looking at her and uh, some of the mistakes she made and some of the things that she did that was good. We're going to open up with, a, with the Lord's Prayer here. So if you would pray with me as he taught us to pray. Let us pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. All right, we'll get right to the study here as soon as I get it pulled up. We're looking at the Genesis chapters 2 and 3. We're looking at Eve, the mother of all mothers. How would you like to have been the first mother? Ladies, how would you like to have been the first mother? What would it have been like to be the mother of all mothers? What can we learn from her? I think Eve gets a lot of... Excuse me. I think Eve gets a lot of bad, a bad, a lot of bad publicity, especially in our day of, let's play, the blame game mentality. The first woman, chapter 2, verses 18 through 23. She was the product of divine creation. Let me say that again. The first woman, Eve, was the product of divine creation. Eve was not born as other women are born. Eve was not born as other women are born. She was never a baby, never a child, or daughter, or maiden. The first female born was Eve's daughter. Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. That's Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. This is the summit of creation. No animal can knowingly glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Only man 
has an awareness of God's presence. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. That's the, God, that's the Gospel of John, chapter 4, verse 24. Mankind has a spirit life, a God consciousness, because he alone is created in the image of God and his likeness. There was something unique about the creation of man, and that uniqueness is God's image in man. All scripture here I'm using tonight is from the New American Standard Bible. It is reads almost the same way as the King James Version does. The root idea of image is a shadow, outlined resemblance, a profile, or a definite resemblance. Man created in the image of God has intelligence, emotion, will, a spiritual nature. The reformers saw that image as knowledge, righteousness, and holiness. Only men and women, because they are created in the image of God, can have fellowship with God. The only exact representation of that image is in the person of Jesus Christ. Look at Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. In Christ, we view the perfect man with that divine image. Eve was fashioned out for Adam. She was a perfect woman in her innocence. Read how beautifully, read how beautifully Moses records her creation in Genesis chapter 2, verses 18 through 20. Then the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. Out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the sky and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called a living creature, that's, that was its name. The man gave names to all the cattle and to the birds of the sky and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper suitable for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. Then he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that <clears throat> excuse me, at that uh, place. The Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. Eve was God's special creation for Adam. Not a single one of the animals in creation was like Adam. Eve was prepared for Adam. Adam's companion was specially created by God in God's image so she could have communion with God and Adam. Men and women are different, but they are more alike than anything else in creation. God created sexuality. God created sexuality. Sexuality is the result of the creative act of God. He intended it to be excuse me, he intended it to be something beautiful and wholesome. Maleness and femaleness is in God's design. Men are to be men and women are to be women. It is not the other way around. Men are not women, women are not men. How tragic when men try to be women and women try to be men. Obviously, you cannot reproduce that way. That should be a clear revelation that anyone who would try to change our sexual nature and dynamics is wrong. How can they possibly become one flesh as God intended husband and wife to be? Eve was the most beautiful woman created. She represents divine perfection. In a summary passage, Moses said, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God saw all that he had made. And behold, it was very good. That's Genesis chapter 1, verses 27 and 31. I think God saw in Eve the loveliest woman ever made. Her face, features, and form 
were incredibly beautiful. I think even far more beautiful than the woman who recently won the Miss Universe pageant. Adams saw her beauty and wrote the first love poem to a woman. Genesis chapter 2 verse 23 says, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Eve was someone beautiful in body, mind, and spirit. If you loved beautiful women, I think she would have been a delight to be around. The first wife. Eve was the first wife. Genesis chapter 2, verses 24 and 25. Adam named the woman Eve. Her name means living or life, and she was the mother of all the living. Uh, chap that's Genesis chapter 3, verse 20. She is life-giving. The first family probably had many sons and daughters because Adam lived 930 years. We do not know how old Eve was when she died, but we can surmise that she lived probably about as long as Adam. God gave them God gave, God gave them the responsibility of populating the earth. Look at Genesis chapter 1, verses 27 and 28. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. He created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. How would you have liked to be the first mother? Have you ever thought about what her life would have been like? I wonder how she parented. We parent the way we were parented until God reparents us. Eve started from scratch. God designed Eve to be a help meet for Adam. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. That's Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. She was designed to complement Adam, not to be in stiff competition with him. She was to be a helper, not a slave. I think one of the most destructive things that have come out of the modern feminist movement is the intense competition created between husbands and wives and the blurring of parental roles and responsibilities. Men don't know how to respond because it goes against nature. Instead of being a helper in far, <clears throat> in far too many homes, she has become his greatest competition. It is a competitive role instead of a supportive one. The Bible beautifully says, they shall become one flesh. One of my, <clears throat> one of my teachers said, they are, two, they are two contrasting entities becoming one compound unity. Eve is to be a companion of Adam. The human body is nothing to be ashamed about. It is something beautiful that God created. The Apostle Paul uses this passage when he speaks of the church as the body of Christ. Look at Ephesians chapter 5 verses 31 and 32. Divorce was not in God's plan. Excuse me. Divorce was not in God's plan. Jesus accepted. Jesus accepted the historical <clears throat> the historical credibility of Genesis. In Matthew chapter 19 verses verses 4 through 9, he spoke of divorce and said it was granted only because of the hardness of heart. We have divorces only because mankind rebelled against the laws of God. Selfishness destroys marriages. You cannot worship you cannot worship at the shrine of self and have a strong, healthy marriage and family. A woman has the power to bless or destroy a man's life. She can either love, cherish, honor, and build him up or tell or tear him down and finish him off. 
May God help us to refocus our lives and our marriages on priorities that build strong, healthy marriages. The first woman without sin. Chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. We're going to look at that for a few minutes here. Eve had no inherited sin. Let me say that again. Eve was the first woman and she was without sin. Eve had no inherited sin. Okay. You and I are born depraved. We start life with a strong, deadly bent toward sin. It is our sinful nature. The psalmist David wrote in Psalm 51 verse 5, Behold, I was brought forth in inequity, and in sin my mother conceived me. David's mother was not involved in an immoral act. Man's condition is that he is a partaker of a sinful nature from the moment of his birth and conception. Our nature is egocentric or self-centered. We are born desiring our own way rather than God's will. Adam's sin left humanity with a corrupt nature that is in bondage to sin. And under condemnation, we sin because we are sinners. It is our nature to sin. We were conceived in sin and by nature children of wrath, the servants of sin, the subjects of death and eternally lost unless unless the Lord Jesus Christ sets us free by his sovereign saving grace. God in love gave Adam a commandment even before Eve was created. Genesis 2 verses 15 through 17. Then the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to cultivate it and to keep it. The Lord God commanded man saying from any tree of the garden you may eat freely but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat for in the day for in the day that you eat from it you will surely die eve was pure and innocent in the garden there were no hidden surprises for adam and eve god did not suddenly change the rules on them there were no hidden agendas God strictly told them this tree was off limits. It is his garden. It is God's garden. The first temptation here. The first temptation. Temptation in itself is not sin. Satan made it look so beautiful to defy God's word. He lied and is still telling the same lie even to this day. He is always disguising himself as the shining one. Genesis 3 chapter Genesis chapter 3 verse 1. He makes his temptations so inviting with the fun, thrills and excitement as if God wants to cheat you out of the best life, out of, out of the best in life. The process is always the same. Satan tries to tell every woman that God is cheating you out of the best life has to offer. He wants to make it so inviting as to subtly insist that the grass is always greener in some other home and with someone else's husband or job or position or someone else's children. Satan has a better offer of a perfect husband, a perfect home, and a perfect environment, perfect children with perfect features, and of course, perfect behavior. Why, Eve, you can have it all, and you won't have to wait. You can have it now. No discipline, no cross, no discomfort, no pain. It is all yours if you want it. Here, take ye, it is yours. Satan led her to doubt God's word. Her husband didn't help. He didn't refute the false assumptions and hypotheses that Satan offered. If it makes you feel good, do it. They didn't stop to ask, what is the worst thing that could happen if... Fill in the blank there. Yes, Eve, you are free to choose, but you are not free to choose the consequences of your actions. Men and women are always choosing what they think is in their best interest. They freely choose, but it is based on wrong thinking. 
Jonathan Edwards said the problem is not with the will itself because the will always chooses what it thinks is best. The will is always free and always chooses what it judges best in any situation. The problem for the will is what Martin Luther termed the bondage of the will. The problem is with our moral nature. We are dead in trespasses and sins, which is opposed to God. Our sinful motives flow from our corrupt, sinful nature. The sinner always makes the wrong choices. Because of our fallen nature, we resist and reject God's best choice for us, since the will is simply the mind making choices and what it thinks is best for the individual, it is terribly influenced by its depravity. Unless the grace of God intervenes, no one chooses God or embraces the free offer of salvation through the atoning work of Jesus Christ. We always want our will and our way and left to our sinful choices, we would never ask God for salvation. I need to stop here for a moment and get a drink. Did you notice in verse 3 that Eve added to what God originally said? You shall not... Okay, I lost my place here. Okay. The free gift is not like the transgression, for by the transgate, for that's not right. Is that right? okay? Here we go. Eve thought, well, if I don't touch it, if I don't touch, I'm going to eat. Satan trying it came right out and contradicted God. He lied. He lied. He is always lying and bending the truth to fit his own schemes. Eve saw. She coveted. She took. Excuse me. She, Eve saw, she coveted, she took, she ate, and she became the world's first sinner. Eve was the world's first sinner. Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. Eve chose to give up her innocence for thorns, thistles, and tears. The process of sin is still the same. When the woman saw that the tree was good, for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable <clears throat> to make one wise she took from its fruit and ate and she gave also to her husband with her and he ate when Adam saw it was safe he joined in the fun and ate it up too Adam as the federal head of the human race led his whole family down the long slide of sin and depravity. In Adam, we all sin. He is the head of our family until we are adopted into God's family. Romans chapter 5, verses 12 through 15 should wake us up, and it reads, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sin for until the law, sin was in the world. But sin but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses, even over those who had not sinned in the likeness of the offense of Adam, who is a type who is a type of him who was to come. But the free gift is not like the transgression. For if by the transgression of the one the many died. Much more did the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abound to the many. The image 
in mankind was defaced, but not destroyed by sin at the fall. Genesis chapter 3. Mankind today is not what God fully intended him to be. The effects of the fall are seen on every level of our lives. When a person is regenerated or born again, he is restored spiritually. It is like being raised from the dead. Man is in spiritual essence made in the image of God. He is like God in his spiritual nature. We know what the image is like when we study man before the fall. The perfect man Jesus and the new man regenerated by the Holy Spirit when he is born again. We put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. A renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, and free man. But Christ is all and in all. That's the Colossians chapter 3 verses 10 and 11. The believer is being conformed. The believer is being conformed to the likeness of his son. That's Romans chapter 8 verse 29. God makes a new creation. Eve was the first seamstress. Uh, Genesis chapter 3 verse 7. She was the first woman to use cover up. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. The only problem is it didn't work. Fig leaves, fig leaves have never covered the guilt of sin. Let me say that again. Those fig leaves didn't work because fig leaves have never covered the guilt of sin. There is only one remedy for sin. There is only one remedy for sin. God provided the first garments that cover sin. Verse 21. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. I think when he made the coverings, he explained that the animal gave up its life so that they have coverings. Behind those garments, there has been a substitutionary penal sacrifice by death, his garments of skin foreshadowed the spotless robe of righteousness that covers all our sins. Uh, look at Second Corinthians chapter five, verse twenty-one. God made, God made. It was His own free gift for Adam and Eve. He took matters into His own hands, and by the shedding of blood, which is implied, He provided a covering. For them, even with skins, we stand naked if we are not clothed in the righteousness of Christ. God laid the foundation for animal sacrifice in these in those coverings. The first wounded mother, Eve was the first wounded mother. Genesis chapter four verse eight. The trail of sorrow and anguish always follows sin. Cain, her firstborn, became became angry and killed Eve's son, Abel. That we see that in Genesis chapter 4, verse 8. And it came about when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. Eve has the dishonor of being the mother, mother of the first murderer. You can imagine the chaos that was created by the first sin and its evil effect on the first couple. Home life and the family were broken up because of sin. Eve had another son, and her name disappears from history, but not without a word of hope. Eve could identify with the pain and hurt that some of you are experiencing. I am sure she felt guilt when she looked at the consequences of her actions and behavior. She could say, no one knows the grief I suffered because of the loss of my two sons. She knew the embarrassment. Okay, my computer's doing something strange here. All right, here we go. She knew the embarrassment and damage beyond repair of having a son 
become the first murderer in history. She knew the grief of losing both sons, one to death and the other to estrangement. The wonderful promise of the seed of the woman, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. God provided perfect salvation for a sinning race. As they stand confronted with their sin and plead their guilt before God, there is a marvelous promise of redemption. God is spelling out judgment on Satan when he says in verse 15, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between her seed and and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. Dr. Harold Steigers writes, Genesis is the record of God's work of deliverance from the corruption of original sin resulting from the fall. God's redemptive work began with Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Dr. Dr. Merrill C. Tenney says, It may be believed that resurrection faith is at the center of the paradox of the Savior man and the crushing of the head of the serpent. Deliverance was promised, and in order to effect that deliverance, the Redeemer had to be able to conquer death. He adds, How could Christ, the seed of the woman, take upon himself the consequences of the serpent's sting and yet live? Resurrection seems to be the answer. Death symbolized the wounding of the heel by Satan and takes place before the smashing of the head of Satan by the seed of the woman. The wounding appears to be the death on the cross since Christ identifies his executioners as the seed of the serpent. Jesus said, You are of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning, and he does not stand in truth because there is no truth in him. That's the Gospel of John, chapter 8, verse 44. This preceding death makes mandatory the resurrection of the seed of the woman to perform the smashing of the serpent's head. Genesis 3.15 is the first shining light on the horizon of eternal life. It is the root of Abraham's obedience to the Lord to offer Isaac as a burnt sac- as a burnt offering. Why else would he make such a sacrifice if he did not have the hope before him that God would raise the son of the promise from the dead? Abe probably believed the seed of the woman was the promise of a seed through Isaac. Abraham considered that God is able to raise man even from the dead, from which he also received him back as a type. Uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 19. Jesus said, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. This promises in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, was no doubt the cause of Abraham greeting the day of Christ with glad assurance in the Gospel of John, chapter 8, verse 54. Genesis is, more, Genesis is more than a story. It is the record of God's work on behalf of the redeemed. It is the history of God's redemptive work. Romans, chapter 16, verse 20 reads, The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. That crushing, that crushing certainly includes all the labor of Jesus the Messiah. The hope of the resurrection is as old as sinful man and is mighty to support them in all their pilgrimages to heaven. Dr. Harold Steigers says Genesis 3.15 has become the most important verse in all the Bible. The central message of the whole Bible, Old and New Covenants, is the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The greatest commentary on Genesis 3.15 is John 3.16. No doubt, the seed of the woman is referring to the virgin birth of Christ. The virgin born conquers death, hell, and the grave. Christ will give the death blow to Satan when he returns. The antagonism between Jesus 
and Satan reaches its climax with the bruising of Jesus and the crushing of Satan and his power. Donald, Donald Barnhouse said, When the Lord Jesus Christ was born, Satan's hatred came to white heat. We can see the hatred of Satan at every point in the earthly story of the life of our Lord. The child of promise, the seed of the woman, the branch of David was born. The eternal word was made flesh. The promises were fulfilled. And Satan bruised the heel of the Lord Jesus Christ and had his own head crushed in the bruising. The bruising of the Lord Jesus took place at the cross. Satan had nailed Jesus to the cross. It was not defeat because three days later, Jesus rose from the tomb triumphantly. John Kirsner writes, While Satan was celebrating his triumph in battle over the Son of God, the full weight of the atonement accomplished by the crucifixion which the devil had effected came down on him, and he realized that all this time, so far from successfully battling against the Almighty, he had actually been carrying out the purposes of the all-wise God. Jesus took the place of the sinner, bearing his punishment, and broke the power of Satan in the process. Remember, in Adam we all die, but in Christ we are all made alive. Who is your father? To whose family do you belong today? Who is the head of your fat family, Adam or Christ? We can learn from Eve's mistakes. We do not have to go down the same journey she did. Satan uses the same lies and the same techniques on us he did on Eve. Let's learn from her mistakes and put on the whole armor of God as a defense to defeat, to defeat Satan in his tracks. You can overcome temptation today. You can be a winner in the greatest vocation in life. But you have to be responsible to build in the safeguards. No one else can do it for you. Make a commitment of your life today to be a godly mother. Begin each day with, the, with a determination to let Christ live his life through you in your home. Where do the greatest temptations come to you? In what area of your marriage, your responsibilities as wife and mother, are you suddenly tempted? What are you doing to make sure you don't blow it? Is there a temptation at the office with co-workers? Or do you sneak off to the stat chat lines on the internet thinking no one will ever know about your secret desires and intrigues? Nothing is secret on the internet. Every webmaster knows who visits his site. If he is unethical, he gleans your email every time you click on his chat site or pornography site. Do the soap operas bring out the worst in you or the novels you read? Do something about it now. Do something now to make a change in your behavior. Burn the magazines. Clean off your hard drive. Get up and do something away from the TV. Your marriage and your commitment to it should be the most important thing in your life. It is more important than your job or position or, or responsibilities in the community. Make a commitment to yourself to not buy into Satan's lies about you, your husband, and your family. If you are a hurting mother, take time to heal. If you are hurting because of the pain of divorce, grief, emotional injury, or other loss, start a support Start a support group in your church. Learn, th learn through other women's encouragement. Get into a healthy women's Bible study. I'm not talking about a poor as me club. Find a mature, healthy group of Christ-centered women who love Him and serve Him. Find true friends who will confront you with your indiscretions. Grow from your hurt and reach out to someone else who is hurting to share God's love and grace. If your mother is still living, take time to tell her you love her today. We need to tell those that we love how important they are to us now. We can't afford to wait. My mother said, send me the roses now, not after I die. Accept God's provision of salvation today. If you have blown it, stop and pray and ask God's forgiveness. Jesus Christ went to the cross and died for your sins. He wants to give you 
His peace right now. He is committed to your very best. God saves the whole person. The context of this great passage of Scripture on Eve is the creation. Men and women created in the image of God. God saves us spiritually first. We acknowledge our need of salvation and with conviction confess to Him our sinfulness and place our faith in Jesus Christ as our only possible Savior. Mankind has been running from God ever since Adam and Eve rebelled against Him. God, in His grace, reaches down to the depraved sinner and regenerates the sinner spiritually. This is the new birth. He is born spiritually. We were dead in trespasses and sins. Man's spirit, that part that communes with God, died instantly when Eve disobeyed. Communion was broken, and eventually they died physically. The moment you are born again, that spirit part of your nature is restored. Your sins are forgiven. You have a new nature. Then the Holy Spirit, in His work of sanctification, renews the image of the person after the image of the perfect man, Jesus Christ. This takes a lifetime as He works in your soul. Then on the resurrection day, this physical body of ours will be redeemed and glorified like the resurrection body of our Savior. This concludes our Bible study. Yeah, I'm sorry. This concludes our Bible study as we look at in Genesis at the story of Eve and how she has affected all mankind. Her and Adam both brought sin into the world, but Jesus Christ takes it out. So we're going to close out here uh, with the Lord's Prayer once again. Folks, I want you to stay safe, be blessed, stay in the Word, and most of all, Write the word upon your heart. By that, I mean memorize these scriptures that speak to you and draw your attention. Memorize those. That is part of putting on the full armor of God. Let us pray as he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Folks, until next time.